Sounds like work. No, tell them I'm in my chair. Yes, he's just walked in. This is unexpected. I can't believe I'm actually having lunch with spies. <laughs> I'm just a salesman. Exactly. You're a civilian, so the KGB won't be watching. It would be a real service to Great Britain. The film is really shocking um, because I don't think a lot of people now, uh, film goers, know about the Cold War. And what it reveals is, I mean, I, obviously I knew about it, but I didn't know the depths to which it took relations between the countries. Um, is that part of what appealed to you about doing this? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think the, the thing that really appealed to me when I first read the script was a sort of, um, a sort of lens on this world and this story that I hadn't seen before, which was the sort of more personal side of the story. I mean, we've seen, hiya, we've seen many movies where it's been, you know, we've, we've seen the political dimensions and the sort of, uh, the sort of machinations of people's strategies in espionage, but I hadn't really encountered a film that took you into the more intimate side of what it would feel like to be in that situation. And you know, this is partly a film about friendship and loyalty as, as much as it's a film about the period. Um, and so I thought that was fascinating, the sort of having that more personal, sort of warmer look at the people involved. And because the main character is someone who wasn't trained as a spy, he's a regular person, that exposes that a bit more, I think. I'm here to open a door to the top manufacturers in the West. You know, he's he, when he's asked to do these things, um, he certainly doesn't know the danger. He wants to help. He's maybe a little bit flattered. Um, you can see how people would get into these situations out of, out of the greatest possible intentions, then the other shoe falls. Uh, I wonder how many people have been in that situation or were through the course of the Cold War. Well, well they did use civilians, but not that often. Um, I mean, the reason why they used, one of the reasons why they used Gravel Wynn was that he had a legitimate reason to be traveling to the Eastern Bloc and that he was selling uh, factory equipment to, uh, not to the Soviet Union, but to other uh, Eastern European countries. So he had a business doing that, so he had a legitimate cover. So that was the first thing. But they'd also had several, both MI6 and the CIA had had several disasters in the sort of six months to a year leading up to this, where their operatives had been found and assassinated or arrested. And um, they sort of were nervous about putting another one out there to do their job, right? So yeah, they, they, yeah, they, yeah. there's a little bit of that within them. And they'd obviously sort of clocked this guy and thought, well, maybe he's, he's, the, right, he's the right person for the job. And it, it turned out he was really good at it. <laughs> you really are the last man we'd send. Make sure you wear it while you're in Moscow. What does this do? Shoot poison dart? I was really concerned for the two American boys that the Russian double agent uh, stopped and gave the envelope to with no, no explanation and off they went and delivered it. I mean, yeah. thank God they made it. That was they really- They did make it and they've talked about it a lot since. Yeah, I mean, they didn't know quite what they were, what they were part of. And, you know, I mean, I suppose Americans traveling to the Soviet Union at that time, you've got to be pretty sort of, adventurous because we're, right, we're right after the sort of McCarthy era, you know, you've got to be quite an open-minded person to just sort of get off your own back, go on a trip to the Soviet Union at that time. Everyone you meet, assume they're KGB. Every Russian is an eye of the state. It will just be a career. Just a career for Russian see. The second half of the film, um, what Greville goes through is just horrific just horrific and of course there's no information for his wife um do you think seeing uh, a person in this situation might put people off uh being whistleblowers or being witnesses i mean it kind of that's put really, me off <laughs> that's a really good question i mean uh, listen i suppose one of the ideas in the movie is we don't really know what we're capable of until we're put into that situation Right. And that's very true of Greville Wynn. I mean, he didn't know, first of all, that he was ever going to be doing anything like this. He was a sort of mildly dissatisfied middle-aged guy, you know, like many people at that, uh, at that age, sort of, oh, is, the, is, the, is that all there is kind of yeah. feeling about life. Oh, I'm in my job. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. 
um, but uh, yeah, but uh, and so he didn't know that he was going to do any of it. And then and then and then he did. I mean, the interesting thing is, it was quite hard to find out the truth of what actually happened because he sort of fictionalized his own past in order to sort of sell books. However, they're not a bad read. And, I bet, and, yeah. Yeah, they're not a bad read. And actually, when you get, you can sort of tell immediately when there's something authentic there. And what happened to him in prison, in our version, is really true. It was sort of worse than that. It was devastating. I, I bet if you asked him towards the end of his life whether he would rather <laughs> have done it or not, he'd say, I'd rather have done it. Because yeah, he did play, yeah. a, he did do something incredible. And, uh, he, you know, he, and, and he also was hugely affected by his friendship with Pankowski, who he, who he sort of adored. I mean, it was a, it was a sort of bromance. They, they really clicked, these two guys, and they meant the world to each other. So it was an extraordinary sort of adventure. I am asking you to stop going to Moscow. I am asking you as your wife. I didn't want you to be involved. <laughs> you shoot any scenes in Russia? No, we didn't. We shot all the, most Eastern Bloc stuff, we shot, most of the Russian stuff we shot in Prague. Uh, we did do some of it in London, actually. And we were going to go initially to Belarus to shoot a couple of days there because their architecture is sort of wonderful, sort of mid-century. I mean, they've still got the huge sort of uh, statues of Lenin and everything there. It's like sort of preserved. But in the end, it was too, it was too complicated to actually get the thing done there. So we didn't. Pankowski's still seen as a sort of terrible traitor. And it's, it's, it's a story that's very much better known over there than it is in the West. Um, I don't think they'd have, they'd have wanted us there, and it probably would have been just too complicated. Forgive me, I'm, I'm just a bit... Sorry, James, I know you said you had an office in the Board of Trade, but is it possible you actually work? Benedict uh, Cumberbatch has been in a number of spy films, and I love the genre myself. Um, and it, it, it's different from the murder genre, which I think is phenomenally popular. So why is it so, so loved, the espionage? I don't know. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's A, the, level, the stakes are always so high, aren't they? Because it's not just about the individual, it's about the country and, you know, the whole society. And certainly in this, when you're dealing with the <laughs> the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's the whole world. So normally in a spy movie, especially Cold War spy movies, there's a huge amount at stake. And then I think the other thing is the sort of level of deception and the, uh, you know, the difference between sort of private and public worlds. You sort of wonder, you sort of marvel at how they managed to hide their true intentions in the way that they did, and probably still do, because there's actually much going on all over the world now. Um, but it is it is an extraordinary thing that people can, can sort of lie that well. And uh, right. that's interesting. That's always interesting. You never leave me to die, and I'm not leaving him. You know, during the pandemic, I find that we've... Uh, our, uh, the number of films and streaming opportunities that we have are massive. They've kind of troubled a normal year. So uh, do you think people are doing making films during the pandemic be, to make it a plot point or to, because they have the opportunity or they're suddenly creative? How would you look at that? Well, you mean that the, 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 there's more stuff being made at the moment? Is that, yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think, well, I, I suppose I feel, I mean, one of the things I've noticed is, is we've all had so much time to think. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, actually my partner's a writer and he's been really productive. It took a while, like for all of us, when it all started, we were all a bit like, what is this? I don't know who I am. Where am I? Because suddenly your life has like, <laughs> stopped and you're sort of, we all felt this. I mean, I, I was useless for the first couple of months, but actually I noticed that he sort of then clicked out and there's written like, some great stuff sort of back to back because actually you know a lot of create creativity comes from a, from solitude and thought and i think being able to have that time is so unusual i mean most of us you know we are sort of charging about the place most of the time aren't we and sort of getting on with our lives and actually having the time to reflect and think are probably quite good so i i, I suppose what i'm really interested in is what's going to happen in a couple of years time when all this work emerges assuming we do get back to some sort of more of an equilibrium than we're in now uh, uh, you know, to sort of see where that sort of stillness has got us. Because I think I have a feeling that there could be some amazing work coming out. I'm full 
volunteering to bring back the best source of Soviet intelligence you've got at a time where Russia and America are on the brink of nuclear war. Something about uh, the film too is that, you know, we, we see that all the uh, communication is done um, analog and in person and messages and stripes on posts. That's fascinating. That is really interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I loved being reminded of that. So I think- They couldn't even make, you couldn't make a phone call from London to Soviet Union without booking it. Really? You had to, yeah, you had at that point to reserve, you know, you had to put in like two days an advance notice and you'd, you know, you'd book, you'd book the call and so, you might not be allowed it. Yeah. You might not be allowed so why, it. Why did they need that time? I, I mean, think it was just the te- they, I think it was just the technology. I think it was the, the technology, technology for into making international calls in that direction. I mean, I'm sure the Soviet state also wanted to police very heavily uh, the um, you know the content. Um, and you know the funny thing about because so- I actually visited the Soviet Union bizarrely on a school trip in my teens, and one of the things was there were so ma- there were many elements of it that were sort of in advance of the West in, in some of the sort of organisation of society and so on. Um, but some of the technology was so old fashioned and so sort of out and chaotic and out of date. So I don't know what their telecommunication systems were like for private individuals, because I don't know how many people oh. actually had phones, certainly in the early 60s, whereas in the States or in Europe or in Canada or whatever, people yeah. would have had, uh, a lot of people had phones by that point. Maybe we're only two people, but this is how things change. 